I seriously, I, I just, I can't. Cannot deal. Just, ah, uh, I refuse to do this. No, no. Hello, today I'll be talking about my top five OMG moments from episode seven of The 100. And let me tell you, if you have seen this episode, you will know what I'm talking about when I say that this was a really, really big one. Like, um, so I write notes when I watch the episode so that I know what to talk about with you guys. And seriously, my notes for this episode will literally see that all. Is it going to let me show you? Sounds sad. Here we go. So look. So the notes are all like normal, 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 normal. Still normal, still normal, normal, normal. And then all of a sudden you just get all these capital letters and me screaming. And I was just like, I'm so confused. What's happening? Ah, why? No. Grr basically, but I did it a lot more violently and a lot more loudly, so I'm really, really glad nobody was home when I watched this episode because I squealed at the television many times. Super obvious spoiler warning for this video. If you're not up to date with season three, you are completely missing out, so do yourself a favor and go and watch it. So a lot of my top five LNG moments this week are sort of really close connected together because of what happened. And this first thing I want to talk about isn't an ONG moment, but considering how much I talk about Cabby, I feel like I just kind of have to talk about it. Uh, so I spent a good, like, 20 minutes of this episode being like, when are they going to kiss? Has to happen in this episode, right? They have to kiss in this episode. And then about 20 minutes in, I sort of went, huh. It's not going to be a kiss because they're, they're, they're not even going to be in this episode. And I was right. And literally, there were only three, like, of our starring main cast members. That was Clark and Octavia and Murphy that were actually in the episode. Everything else is just, like, completely recurring characters. Sort of like, okay. I mean, it was still an amazing episode, though. But, you know, cabby. <laughs> oh. Now that I have that out of the way, these... Next ones are my actual top five OMG moments from this episode titled 13. So number one, Octavia and the kill order. So let's start from the beginning of the episode, or I mean not the complete beginning of the episode, but you know, close, you get the idea. So to begin with in this episode, a captured Octavia is dragged into Lex's throne room, control room, uh, the room where she sits and talks a lot. And the grounders who dragged Octavia in um, demanded vengeance for the village that the Sky People would have murdered if Octavia hadn't warned them in time. Lexa, seeing no other choice, uh, calls upon the armies of the Twelve Clans to march on Arcadia but not to attack. They're just to set up um, boundaries outside of Arcadia and they're only to kill people if they're caught outside the walls. Which is still pretty bad because it means that Sky People are kind of stuck in Arcadia now and I mean it, was, it looks like a nice enough place but I don't, I don't really think I'd like to be stuck there like at all. So the only way Arcadia can return to the Coalition and become the 13th clan once again is if they banish slash kill Pike. Personally, I have no problem with that whatsoever, not even a tiny little bit. Pike is seriously awful, like if anyone on this show deserves to die, it will be him. While all of this is going on, of course, Octavia finds Indra, tells her to stop wallowing in self-pity, and by the end of the episode, the two of them are headed to Arcadia to do a thing that I'm sure will be super awesome and badass once we find out what it is. I was doing pretty okay with predicting things and then bam, everything just kind of blew up in my face. And yeah, you'll see why in a minute. Number two, Polaris flashbacks. So in this episode, we really got to dive into the Polaris flashbacks and we got to see the exact moment when Ali got the launch codes and launched the nuclear missiles that ended the world. It was actually a really moving scene, like to see Becca and the commander and the other chick with glasses are sort of staring out the window and seeing like all these nuclear bombs like boom boom you know destroying the world um so Becca sort of gave us a reason why Ali did this apparently Ali launched the co like launched the nuclear stuff uh to find a solution to the problem of too many people on the planet uh mm, yeah well we definitely have too many people on the planet but I I really don't think that nuclear war is the answer <laughs> Uh, we also finally got an answer to why Polaris was blown up in the first place. Turns out that the other stations actually blew it up because the captain or commander or the, the person in charge, uh, he refused to dock with them because Becca was working on a second AI and she refused to destroy it. She claims that the problem with Ali was that Ali doesn't understand human emotions, but according to her, this second AI supposedly will. So it's going to be an artificial intelligence that's super smart and has a knack for understanding humans' wants and fears. Awesome. 
let's, let's just wait and see how that plays out. Number three, Klexa. Yay! I jump up and down, sort of do a little happy dance moment because Klexa finally uh, acknowledged their feelings for each other. They kissed, they slept together. It was beautiful and adorable and everyone was like rejoicing and excited. Um, to be fair though, as soon as Lexa sort of said in that meeting that she was ordering a kill order on any person outside of the boundary after sundown, it was pretty obvious that this was going to happen in this episode because obviously Clark wouldn't be allowed to stay in Polis since if she did, Lexa would then be either forced to kill her, which it would suck for both of them, or she would not kill her and then lose control of her people, which would also suck for both of them. So, of course, the only logical thing to do is to sleep together before they left and can never see each other again. Because that's, you know, clever. Uh, all I can say about this is that it was 100% um, perfect timing for it. You know, it worked uh, in the plot. It worked for character development. It's exactly what I predicted would happen. The guy thought the door was opening there. <laughs> and especially... I predicted something way back, like, towards the beginning of the season. I said to my friend, I was like, as soon as Clark and Lexa sleep together, this thing's going to happen. And I was right. Despite all that, I still was really glad to see them sleep together because, you know, I wanted to see them happy. And that lasted so long. And that brings us to number four, Lexa. So poor Lexa, of course met her untimely demise in this episode. Seriously though, I mean, like I said, I pretty much predicted it um, since I always, you know, I said, that's what I said to my friend. I said, I'm like, if Clark and Lexa sleep together, Lexa's gonna die like almost immediately after. But we both thought it was gonna be like the next episode, not the next scene. Let's just, well, all right, let's backtrack a little bit here. So Clark tells Lexa to, well, no, Clark doesn't tell Lexa or anything. In fact, that doesn't even happen. Clark leaves Lexa and returns to her own room only to find Murphy tied up inside. A little bit, you know, creepy and really gross. Um, Titus, of course, our beautiful, mysterious man in the monk robes, uh, he reveals himself to be holding a gun, which is something I'm pretty sure in their, like, mythology or lore or religion or whatever, it says that if a sky person ever picked up a gun, no, not a sky person, if a tree crew person ever picked up a gun, then they would all die because it's something about something or other. I don't know, it was a weird law, but in any way, Titus apparently isn't listening to it because he has this gun and he is going to kill Clark, probably because Lexa listens to her too much. Something I have been saying this entire season and if people listen to me, we could have avoided this whole thing. Uh, Titus, of course, is just like, you know, shoot, shoot, bam, bam, and he doesn't really know how to aim a gun. So unfortunately, Clark, well, I mean, it's not unfortunately for Clark, she manages to dodge the bullet, but unfortunately it hits Lexa in the stomach and she, you know, dies. It was probably one of the saddest, like one of the sadder death scenes that I've seen on TV um, for quite a while. Um, it's not the saddest death scene that I've ever seen, Red Wedding anybody, uh, but it's definitely one of the sadder ones, you know, so Clark cried, Lexa cried, I cried. It, you know, it truly was a very horrible scene and it was made a million times worse um, when Titus just kind of like flips her over and like cuts into her neck, which brings me to my fifth and final top five OMG moment for the episode, Ally 2.0. Yeah, so you remember the second AI that Becca made, the one that she apparently escaped with. Uh, she was apparently her on the escape pod from Polaris that we see in Polis, funnily enough. Um, turns out that Becca landed safely in Polis, uh, wearing a spacesuit with the word command on it. So I wonder where the ground has got that idea. And she had the AI in the back of her neck. Like literally, she'd cut into her neck and put the AI inside. And as we saw when Titus took it out of Lex's neck, it had like mushed itself onto something. It turns out that when the grounders say the spirit of the commander, they're actually talking about this AI, which I think only a few people know. So I think the Obviously, Titus knows because he's the flame keeper, so he's the keeper of this AI when it's not inside a commander. And obviously, the commander knows because they have to be willing to cut open their neck and let the AI inside. It's really gross, actually. I don't know. It's really, it's really gross. So Titus is, like I said, he's the one in charge of making sure that the AI passes from one commander to another. So if we are to believe what Becca said about the AI being super smart and able to understand human emotions. Obviously, this is going to have a super huge impact um, on 
the show and where we go from now because obviously this AI is going to move into someone different and we just are going to have to wait and see if they're going to be as awesome and as willing to listen um, as Lexa is. But, you know, tell me this. So if it's able to understand human emotions and it's like the grounders, then where did this ground custom of blood must have blood come from? How does that help humanity? After such a whirlwind of an episode, I have a lot of questions, but as always, I've managed to narrow it down to just four. Question number one, do I actually need to say it? If you've been watching this, you will know exactly what my first question is. Question number two, are Clark and Murphy going to be killed since they won't be in Arcadia after the kill order is in place? In fact, they're still going to be in Polis because Titus kind of locked them in. Question number three, who's going to be the new commander? So I had a thought um, not too long ago, actually before Lexa even died, I had a thought that if Lexa did die, Clark would be the new commander because like Lexa said that her spirit would find her and I kind of figured her spirit would probably find Clark. But I'm not sure if that will happen, but it would be pretty cool if it did. And question number four, is the second AI really helping humanity? And if Ali gets her hands on it, is she going to destroy it? Because it's not going to think the same as her. Thanks for watching. As always, like and subscribe to this video so you don't miss a thing. Stay random. Bye. Okay. Oh my god, please put this in. Oops. No. <laughs>